chase a thing till he thinks he's chased it enough. And he quits. Same way when he runs. When you think Western movie star, one name leaps out above all others, John Wayne. So we'll find him in the end, I promise you. We'll find him. Just as sure as the turning of the earth. The Duke remains, in a word, iconic. He strides across the screen as the ultimate man's man and the hero of the plains. It's easy to imagine that he sprung fully formed from the pages of weather-beaten Elmore Leonard or Zane Grey paperbacks, pistols blazing in the sun. But of course, that isn't how it happened at all. And Wayne himself was hardly the instant success we might imagine. Hi, I'm movie man Eric Houston, and as most of you already know, John Wayne wasn't born in cowboy boots or in a 10 gallon hat. Born in 1907, the young Marion Morrison had no ambitions to be a cowboy or even a movie star. As a child, he really only wanted one thing, to get out of Iowa. He didn't like the outdoors, hated horses, farm life, and even his own name. Marion's father doted on him, but his mother was at best indifferent and, at worst, openly resented him. Marion saw studying the law as his way out and attended the University of Southern California on a football scholarship. One day, while body surfing, he broke his collarbone, ending his football career and, with it, his scholarship and chance at a college education. With the help of Western superstar Tom Mix, Wayne got a job in the prop department of Fox Studios. There, he was spotted by director Raoul Walsh. Impressed by Marion's physique, Walsh improbably cast the young man as the lead in 1930's The Big Trail. The way is clear ahead, all gentle slopes. So drive down, my friends, and settle it. Lead the way. Zeke will lead the way down. Our trails fork here. You mean you are leaving us? There's a trail I've followed for over 3,000 miles now. And I'm heading back to pick it up again and follow it to the end. Coleman, you're the breed of man that would follow a trail to the end. Thanks, Bascom. The film was designed to be the first big Western spectacle of the sound era and was one of the very first movies shot in widescreen. The big trail was, sadly, a big flop, but it did succeed in giving Marion the acting bug and in granting him a new name. You see, Walsh also disliked Marion's name. Inspired by the name of a Revolutionary War hero, Walsh suggested the name Anthony Wayne to the brass at Fox. They countered with John Wayne. Marion wasn't even in the room. After the failure of the big trail, though, no major studio would hire the newly christened actor. Instead, he ended up starring in dozens of cheapy B-Westerns for less desirable studios, like Monogram Pictures, Mascot Pictures, and other often fly-by-night studios from Hollywood's so-called Poverty Row. Chuck your guns out low and cinch them on tight. There'll be blood a-running in town before There'll be guns a blazing and singing with love. Why, that's singing Sandy. Tonight you'll be drinking Who? your The most drink notorious gunman since Billy the Kid. The dead. Make it fast, Slippery. This is your last draw. You'll never handle guns again, Morgan. These films were often shot in three to five days, and Wayne would make at least a dozen of them every year. Still, they offered Wayne not only the chance to act, but to have his name above the title. Wayne worked like this for 10 long years, slogging away in B pictures. But the sheer number of movies kept him constantly in the eyes of the audience, and he did begin to develop a cult following. Finally, Wayne's friend, director John Ford, 
took pity on the hard-working actor and cast him again as the star of a major A-level motion picture, mm -hmm. Stagecoach. Hey, look, it's Ringo. Yeah. Hello, kid. Hello, Curly. Hi, uh, Buck. How's your folks? Oh, just fine, Ringo, except my grandfather came Shut up. Shut up. Didn't expect to see you riding shotgun on this run, Marshal. Going to Lordsburg? I figured you'd be there by this time. No. Lame horse. Well, it looks like you've got another passenger. Yeah. I'll take the Winchester. You may need me in this Winchester, Curly. Stagecoach catapulted Wayne to true fame and forever established his screen persona, brave, dependable, quiet, a protector of the innocent, but also a rebellious loner. In essence, combining the best elements of silent stars, William Hart and Tom Mix. In the years that followed, Ford became a surrogate parent to Wayne and the two became frequent collaborators. Stagecoach almost didn't get made though. In 1939, the glut of cheaply made B-Westerns, many of them Wayne's, had given the genre a sort of black eye, so much so that cheap and Western seemed practically synonymous. The success of Stagecoach, though, revived the studio Western and gave Wayne numerous projects in which to star. But World War II soon threatened all of that. Numerous major Hollywood stars enlisted to fight in the war, and Wayne felt enormous pressure to do the same. At the same time, he was desperate to hold on to his newfound fame. He'd worked so hard to escape the grueling schedule of B-Westerns and was loath to give it all up. At last, Wayne decided not to fight. And instead, like Roy Rogers, he reaped the benefits of a Hollywood missing so many of its major stars and cemented his fame for decades to come. It was a decision that Wayne wouldn't exactly regret, but one for which he would forever harbor deep insecurities. Sorry, sir. Never apologize, mister. It's a sign of weakness. It didn't help that John Ford, who had not only served but received the rank of Rear Admiral, would hector Wayne about his inaction for the rest of their lives. Still, by 1949, Wayne had become the number one movie star in the world appearing primarily in Western and war pictures. His screen image seemed to sync perfectly with how post-war America saw itself, full of strength, confidence, and swagger, a rugged individual and the protector of the world. And all of it, the speech, the way he walked and dressed, were learned and rigorously practiced. Wayne studied himself and all of his old pictures to control the way he looked and the way people saw him. Despite their differences, Wayne and Ford remained close friends and close collaborators. 1955's The Searchers perhaps represented the best of both their talents. From Ford, lush, widescreen photography, capturing the majesty of Monument Valley. From Wayne, the peak of his loner protector character, now tinged with dark obsession and racial hatred as his character devoted his life to searching for a girl kidnapped by Native Americans. What good did that do you? By what you preach, none. But what that Comanche believes, ain't got no eyes, he can't enter the spirit land, has to wander forever between the winds. You get it, Reverend. Come on, blanket head. By the end of the 1950s, though, Westerns were beginning to change. Americans were losing their appetites for straightforward westerns, and instead, films like High Noon, which in some ways deconstructed the western genre, were taking over. We've got an hour. What's an hour? Oh, we could What's read... a hundred miles? We'd never be able to keep that store, Amy. They'd come after us, and we'd have to run again as long as we live. No, we wouldn't. Not if they didn't know where to find us. Oh, Will. But I'm begging you, please, let's go. I can't. Don't try to be a hero. You don't have to be a hero, not for me. I'm not trying to be a hero. If you think I like this, you're crazy. Look, Amy, this is my town. I've got friends here. I'll swear in a bunch of special deputies, and with a posse behind me, maybe there won't even be any trouble. You know there'll be trouble. Then it's better to have it here. 1952's High Noon was unlike most other Westerns of the day which is part of why it remains so memorable. 
the sweeping vistas, the color photography, the constant action, the noble, unflappable, and self-reliant hero are all gone. In their place is a story of a small town sheriff who doesn't even contemplate trying to beat the odds on his own. Instead, he's quiet, contemplative, and very admittedly afraid. He seeks help from those he's tasked to protect, championing the power of the group over the individual in a story specifically designed as an allegory for the then current communist witch hunt. High Noon was a huge success by any measure, winning four Oscars, including Best Actor for Gary Cooper. But John Wayne hated High Noon. He thought it was un-American and that it represented the antithesis of the Western hero. Director Howard Hawks agreed, and the two collaborated on a new movie, Rio Bravo, that was designed as a counterpoint to High Noon. The stories of the two movies are very similar. A sheriff has to stand up to a band of outlaws who want to kill him, but Wayne is steadfast and unafraid. In Rio Bravo, not only does he not ask for help, he repeatedly turns down offers from the townspeople, siding instead with a team of drunk and ineffectual deputies. See, as good as I used to be, it'd be pretty close. I'd hate to have to live on the difference. Then you got the best of it. Him for me. What's he talking about, him for me? Well, come on, tell me. Nobody ever tells me nothing around here. You heard him, he's quitting. What's good into you? Look at me. Isn't that pretty? Huh? Shaking worse all the time. What can a man do with hands like that? Go ahead, tell me what. Well, take what a drink. You... you said Chance told you to. You did it your Chance. You told him. He can take the whole bottle. Rio Bravo was a success in its own right and is itself a pretty good movie. But the contrast between it and High Noon only served to illustrate twin facts. Westerns were changing, and John Wayne was loath to change with them. Wayne would again visit his own Western ideal in The Alamo, a passion project that he wrote, directed, and produced himself, fighting for almost a decade to get it made. Ultimately, Wayne put all of his clout behind the movie, practically forcing it onto the screen. Republic. I like the sound of the word. It means people can live free, talk free, go or come, buy or sell, be drunk or sober, however they choose. Some words give you a feeling. Republic is one of those words that makes me tighten the throat. Same tightness a man gets when his baby takes his first step or his first baby shaves and makes his first sound like a man. The results, though, were underwhelming. Audiences were uninterested, and the reviews were awful. To make matters worse, Wayne had gone $5 million over budget on the picture, enough to guarantee that no studio would ever let him write or direct his own movie ever again. Despite that failure, Wayne would continue to make highly successful films for the rest of his life, both westerns and war pictures. As he got older, though, he grew more and more dissatisfied at the shape of America, particularly the protests around the Vietnam War and the changing face of western pictures, which were moving further and further away from his preferred ideas of uncomplicated heroism. The spaghetti westerns, Films often shot in Spain by Italian film crews were ushering in a time of anti-heroes and iconoclasts, readily embodied by Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name. There was increasingly little room on the screen for sincere, unironic Westerns. In his 60s now, balding and out of shape, Wayne finally gave in to the prevailing trends and sought to reinvent himself, leaning into his age, condition, and dissatisfaction with life with the role of Rooster Cogburn in 1969's True Grit. I call that bold talk for a one-eyed fat man. 
Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Shoot them! They're too far, they're moving too fast. Just as he created his image all those years ago, he transformed now into something new, working well outside his comfort zone to play the aging, unreliable, and at times downright unlikable gunfighter. His efforts would win him his first and only Oscar. If I'd have known that, I'd have put that patch on 35 years earlier. <laughs> True Grit was, in many ways, a tip of the hat, not only to the changes in himself and the changes in America, but also to the changing face of Westerns, where Wayne could no longer lay claim to the title King of the Cowboys. The flamboyant and steadfast heroes like Tom Mix, Roy Rogers, and even Wayne himself, seemed to be gone forever, replaced by something raw, dangerous, and very much in the spirit of the William Hart Westerns of 60 years before. Looks like we're shy of one horse. <laughs> you brought two too many. Well, with that, it's time to hang up the old spurs and end our look at just some of the actors who could be called King of the Cowboys. I'll be back soon with another peek behind the scenes of the movies and TV shows we all love so well. Until then, stay safe, watch movies.